Hello there! Welcome to the Saroy channel wherever you are in the world and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I hope you're doing great. I'm doing fabulous, thank you very much. And I'm so excited you've joined me for part three of our story tonight because boy is it an interesting story. Adeline was living in an apartment block in New York and it was a very lonely life because she's not from New York. And she had a friend who lived in the apartment above her, an old man called George Charlotta. And he had quite a story behind his life. And we've learnt in the first part of these stories all about that life of his. And what a sad life it was when he was divorced from his wife and had not been in touch with his children for many years. But uh, Adeline discovers a nasty smell in the apartment block and she doesn't realise that George Charlotta has died. So she has an encounter with George Charlotta's daughter and the woman has invited her to come to Canada for the funeral and to meet the rest of the family. So that's where we are now in the story. And I've got a feeling Bigfoot is around the next corner. So let's continue with part three of our story. Viola was comforted that I had agreed to come to George's funeral. But I felt compelled to do so. It was the least I could do in the circumstances, given I had failed abysmably to look in on George the week before. I felt so dreadful to know he died all on his own in that apartment. I could only hope with all my heart and soul that he had not suffered in his final moments. People around the apartment block were visibly shocked that an old man had died on his own in one of the apartments. One of the residents, the woman who initially discovered George was dead, whose name was Mrs Turner, was saying that that could never be allowed to happen again. She called a meeting with all the residents. It was promptly decided we would have an apartment barbecue in the downstairs backyard two to three times a year so that the residents could get acquainted with each other. It was a good idea. We all discussed that if anybody lived on their own in the apartments, we should make an effort to look in on them regularly to see how they were doing. It's absolutely shocking, grossly appalling, said Mrs. Turner, that an old man like George Charlotta, and a very nice man, I might add, dies in our apartment block, and we're so caught up in our own lives that we haven't even bothered to look in on the old man. That can never be allowed to happen again under my watch. It's disgusting, absolutely disgusting, that is what it is. We have a moral duty of responsibility to take care of all of our senior citizens, especially people living on their own. It would seem everybody was hanging their heads in shame, myself included, over what had happened to George Charlotta, all believing that in some way they'd failed the man. And I think we all did, if the bitter truth would be told. When I arrived at Calgary Airport, I was told I would be met by Luca, who was Viola's son, who would take me back to their house in Canmore, which was about an hour and twenty minutes away. When I arrived at the airport, I made my way towards a handsome-looking man, holding up a sign which said, Adeline. I knew at once this must be Luca. He was six foot tall, with blonde hair, blue eyes and a golden complexion. He was easy on the eye. Hello, I said, going up to Luca with my luggage on wheels. You must be Viola's son, Luca. Is that right? That's right. I'm Luca, he said, flashing me a huge smile. There was something about Luca that reminded me of George Charlotta, and I stared at him with bewildered wide eyes. Oh, I'm so sorry I apologised. I didn't mean to stare at you like that. But you remind me a lot of your grandfather. Your grandfather showed me pictures of himself when he was a young man. And I'm not kidding. You could be twins from different generations. The likeness is rather uncanny. You think I look like George? Luca asked me. He looked pleased. I'm very sad that I never got to meet my grandfather. Mum told me all about George. Furthermore, I've read all the letters he wrote my mother when she was a girl that she never received. They were very moving. I could tell that George was a very nice man. Luca insisted on carrying my trolley back to the car, where he unloaded my suitcase into the trunk. We sat together side by side during the journey, talking all the way back to Canmore, which opens up across the floor of the Bow Valley, 
and is flanked on all sides by the front ranges of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. It was easy to talk to Luca. I warned to him at once. It felt as if we'd known each other all our lives, as there were no awkward, uncomfortable silences, and much laughter between the two of us. In so many startling ways, Luca was exactly like his grandfather. Even his dry sense of humour was similar, so I found myself tearing up a whole lot when he spoke to me. Are you all right? Luca asked me, looking concerned. He handed me a tissue. I'm all right. It's just being here with you. It reminds me of spending time with George Shalotta. You're so like him. It's surreal, you know. My mother said much the same thing, Luca admitted. She said when she arrived at George Shalotta's front door, it was like she was fast-forwarding time, meeting me when I was an old man. She said that it gave her goosebumps. Well, she's absolutely right. You're just like George in every way. And a nicer man you can never hope to meet. I'm just so dreadfully sad he died like that. All on his own. It's just tragic. Luca looked at me sympathetically. He reached out to squeeze my hand. The good news is the autopsy report came back. It did? Yes, it did. It seems my grandfather didn't fall down the stairs as many suspected. Instead, he had a massive heart attack. The coroner said he'd probably had a few pains, grabbed his chest and dropped down dead. So he wouldn't have really known very much. Well, I suppose that's a relief. At least he didn't suffer. I'm sure it was the best way to go, Luca agreed. It was not long before we arrived in Canmore, and oh, what a place. I was completely transfixed and bowled over by the idyllic scenery that swaddled me so graciously on every side, not to mention the billowing resplendent contours of the mountains that stole the skyline with their gloriously prominent silhouettes that demanded your immediate attention and awe. Wow! That's beautiful! I said, staring out of the window. This is magnificent! These views! They're to die for! Luca grinned. That's what everyone says when they come to this part of the world. They can't get over the beautiful scenery here. Even though I've lived here all my life, I know I'm lucky to be surrounded by such prepossessing views. Well, you're not kidding about that. If I could choose somewhere to live in the world, it would be a place like this, that's for sure. When I arrived at Viola's beautiful all-wooden home, with its high ceilings, grand fireplaces, and beautiful balconies, I received a rapturous welcome from Viola and her husband Hugh, along with Luca's sister, who were more than thrilled to meet me. I suspected they saw me as their only real connection to George Charlotta, so they welcomed me like I was long-lost family, and asked me to tell them as much as I could about the old man that I had got to know while living at the Forsyth apartment block in New York. If George had known how much interest there was in him, when he'd felt so estranged from his family, I dare say he would have been moved to tears. I was so glad that now George's ex-wife Monica had died, the truth of what a kind, gentle and loving soul George had been had finally come out. It would seem at the end of the day you cannot suppress the truth, however hard you may try for eventually it will seep out like honey from a comb. Finn, who was Viola's brother and George Charlotta's son, had come over to stay at Viola's house for the funeral, all the way from Australia. But regretfully his wife and two adult children remained in Australia. I could see that Finn, much like his sister Viola, was all teared up about his father when he read all the letters George had written them both over the years, when they were children. I can't imagine how cheated he felt to have been denied a relationship with his father due to his mother's willful bias and resolute determination to make sure George played no part in their lives. I think that Monica had now been shown up in a less than favourable light as the ugliness of what she had done to both her children had been fully exposed by the spotlight of her lies that she had told them over the years. True to Viola's word, I was shown around Alberta and made to feel like a very special guest. I was taken to so many magnificent places, which included a great visit to Lake Louise, where I marvelled that the water could actually be turquoise. My friendship with Luca had not gone unnoticed by Viola, who had said to me that since I'd met her son, there was a definite skip in his step. 
Luca is painfully shy, you know, but you're the very first person, Adeline, to bring him out of his shell. I've never heard him talk so much before. My son really likes you, Adeline. He likes you an awful lot. When she told this, my heart warmed, as I'd never met anyone quite like Luca, apart from his grandfather George, of course. I wondered what George would think of my friendship with his grandson, because against all the odds, I would never have met Luca if it wasn't for George Charlotta. It made me realise how bizarre life can be, and the strange set of circumstances that may arise, that lead us to meet unlikely people, that might not otherwise cross our paths. I had no way of knowing that while I was staying here in Alberta, I would have an encounter that would question my own perception of reality. I told myself that I could never have a relationship with Luca. I lived in New York, and he lived in Canada. But the attraction between us seemed to be growing, although I think we both persuaded ourselves that it was not to be, because a relationship would be unlikely to work out when distance is involved. I was staying in a cottage on the premises that overlooked a lush wood grove of trees, where in the furthest distance you could see the smouldering silhouettes of the mountains that seized the skyline with their prominent curvaceous signatures. The self-contained wooden cottage I was staying in was modern by design, practical and relatively open plan. It meant I could enjoy a degree of independence. Viola had even provided me a car for my trip here, so that I could drive around the local area if needs must, to enjoy a little exploration on my own. But Viola was such an excellent host that I'd wanted for absolutely nothing. One night after I returned to bed, I heard a woman's screams coming from the woodgrove. When I heard the scream again, I awoke with a start, wondering what on earth was going on. I remained in my pyjamas and hurriedly put on a pair of sneakers, as the urgency of those screams had seized my prompt attention. I removed a cast-iron fire poker from the fireplace as a makeshift weapon. I took a torch from the kitchen and ventured out into the night, almost as if I was adapted to nocturnal activities, which I most certainly was not. Obstensively, if I'd been in New York, I'd have probably phoned 911 to report a woman screaming. But out here, in what I describe as a wilderness-like setting... There was a whole different set of rules. But in my blind ignorance, I would not have realised that exploring the woods in the middle of the night may not have been the wisest decision on my part. But my wisdom this evening seemed to be otherwise engaged. I do not know why I didn't call Luca or Viola on my cell phone, telling them what I'd heard. But I reasoned with myself that they'd probably long since retired to bed and certainly would not appreciate being woken up in the middle of the night by a guest staying on their premises that had been hysterical over a noise that they had heard that might well be nothing to concern themselves with. I certainly didn't want to make a fool of myself. I decided to investigate the screams all on my own, and I'm not entirely sure why. When I examined my true motives as to why I acted the way that I did, I think I felt so bad that I'd not been able to help out George Charlotta in his moment of trouble. Perhaps I thought helping someone else out would help me in some way redeem myself. So there I was out on a summer's night, where a cool mountain breeze was whipping very gently against my face, as in the mountains at night, even in summer the temperature can dip. I ambled tentatively through the grove of trees, not even knowing exactly where I was going. I do not know why I chose to do this. I am not what I would consider to be a courageous person by any manner of means nor am I particularly comfortable about stumbling around in the darkness like a blind man in unfamiliar territory. There I was, frenziedly making my way through the trees, as the woman's screams seemed to trigger in me a need to respond to those cries, which suppressed the fear response inside me, so that I was driven by an overwhelming need to help her. The woman's cries for help became very pronounced. Someone! Is anybody out there? Please help me! Please help me! Please! Please help me! I now knew someone was in serious trouble. Even with my torchlight, I found it rather hard to navigate my way through the labyrinth of tall, lofty trees. Many at night had bushy branches that reminded me of old, gnarled bones. It felt as if I was walking through a maze. I was losing my way. 
I had no clue where I was actually going. It was intimidating walking in such a dim light that was so faint and so ambiguous that I couldn't barely see the path ahead of me. And even with the bright illumination of my torch, it was so dark in the woods with trees growing so closely together, stealing away the moonlight, so that I got confused as I ventured deeper into the heart of the woods. I soon realised I was lost. At one point the cries for help became fainter and fainter on the wind. I came to the rather unfortunate conclusion that I had to turn around and retrace my steps. I truly felt as if I was playing a game of blind man's buff. My torchlight was so minimal. It helped me little to navigate my way over burgeoning roots that glided over the ground like knotty trails that could seize an unlikely ankle, and if you weren't looking, throw you to the ground so that you could end up having a nasty fall. The ground was richly fertile, but the craggy path ahead of me was littered with ubiquitous rocks that jutted through the ground obtrusively like angry protruding teeth. It was not easy to scramble through the lush vegetation that grew beneath the trees by any manner of means, especially when the lack of light was doing me no favours. All of a sudden I was showered by a flurry of pebbles thrown my way. I remember stopping short in my tracks, knowing something or someone was there, but who? I knew those pebbles had been thrown at me, as if someone was trying to get my attention. Or maybe, maybe they were trying to scare me away. My body froze to the spot. My heart galloped violently in my chest. I was suddenly filled with such an aching, dreadful fear. It was making my temples throb. I wanted to forget all about the woman's cries for help, and hightail it as fast as I could back to the cottage. But my body was disabled by a crippling, paralysing fear. It felt as if I was unable to move forwards, almost as if I was rooted to the spot like one of the trees in the woodgrove. My slim legs had become like thick concrete blocks that were impossible to move. Hello? Hello? I called out nervously. Hello, is anybody there? I threw the light of my torch through the trees. Hello? Hello, is somebody there? Please? Please answer me. Is someone there? This isn't funny, you know. Please? Please? Who threw the pebbles at me? I know you're there. Show yourself. It was then that my torchlight picked up this tall, lofty silhouette, as dark as the night, covered in long, flowing hair. My heart was now thunderously booming in my chest, beating against my ribcage. That was when I saw him, and there are no words to fully describe what I saw, staring at me through the curtain of darkness, with a shape so gargantuan and so daunting, I felt as if I might just faint from the sheer shock of it all. I'm not exactly sure how I managed to hold it together, but I managed to compose myself, so that my focus could be directed precisely on the ambiguous shape standing before me. For a moment I thought I had to be seeing things, as the light of my torch picked up a face. In a moment of startled revelation, I realised I was seeing a Bigfoot, and I was so shocked and so taken aback, my torch nearly dropped to the ground, almost slipping through my damp fingers like butter. I must be mistaken. I had to be, I thought. This is a trick of the light. I didn't see that, did I? I couldn't have seen that. My eyes! No, my eyes were definitely deceiving me. Even at this point, I was doubting what I had seen. Once again, my reluctant torchlight flickered over the Bigfoot's face, and through narrowing eyes I scrutinised him. I was in no doubt of what I was beholding. The Bigfoot remained as still as a tree. He was rigidly stiff, not moving a muscle. He didn't flinch, but his eyes remained fixed on me. In the clawing, insufferable darkness that held all light to ransom, as if it was a traitor that needed to be expunged, I was exposed to the yellow eye shine. Bright eyes pierced through the darkness like traffic lights that you could not miss. My first thought was, Oh my God! Is this Bigfoot going to hurt me? Does he impose a threat to me? What does he want with me? As these questions kept clawing their way in my mind like ugly, gnarled roots, the weirdest thing happened 
a voice appeared to pop into my head and said, I'm not going to hurt you. Come this way. You need to help her. She's trapped. I would help her, but I know I would scare her too much. So you need to do it. When I heard the Bigfoot's voice in my head, I was not sure what to think. Was I going stark raving mad, I wondered. How could someone speak to me in my head like that? I know it sounds preposterous and rather unfathomable, but the Bigfoot spoke to me like an intelligent human being would. But his method of communication was all telepathic. He indicated for me to follow him, leading me through a thicket of narrow paths through the trees that were heavily fringed by burgeoning creepers and branches with thorny talons that tore angrily at my pyjamas. Everything was stoically still and quiet, and then quite suddenly the sound of the grove erupted with crickets and frogs, as if the nocturnal silence had taken a break and was now returning to entertain the evening with its music. We soon reached an open clearing in the woods, where the ground was covered with sprawling creepers. The Bigfoot pointed to a spot on the ground, which I flooded with my torchlight. In there, the Bigfoot said to me in my head, his yellow eyes meeting mine. She's in there. That was when I heard some muffled sobs and a voice saying, We'll get out of here, I promise. Is your leg still hurting you? Then I heard a muted woofing sound. It was a woman talking to her dog. I realised in abject horror that there was a large trench in the ground, possibly about eleven foot deep. But certainly if you fell down there, it would be close to impossible to get yourself out without any assistance or help, as the edges of the ditch appeared to be pretty smooth, so you'd have no places where you could put your feet to climb out of the ditch with ease. The Bigfoot pointed to the ground and to the hollow, and a voice boomed in my head, saying, You need to help her. I hurried over to the ditch, and saw a young woman cradling a dog in her arms. With the light of my torch, I realised it was a French bulldog. She was sweet-talking it, and didn't appear to notice my torchlight. I know your leg is hurting, Tubbs. So is mine. We've really got ourselves into quite the pickle, haven't we? But everything's going to be all right, I promise you it is. Are you all right down there? I asked, leaning over the ditch, my voice beginning to sound like a croak. The young woman practically jumped out of her skin when she heard my voice and noticed my torchlight. She looked up at me from where she was seated at the bottom of the ditch, her frightened eyes filled with relief. Oh my God! Are you real? She asked me. Please, please tell me you're real. Well, I hope I'm real, I said. What on earth are you doing down there in the ditch in the middle of the night like this? I fell, can you believe it? I fell. I can't get out. I'm going to need some help. So is my dog. How did you know I was here? How did I know? I heard your screams for help. Your voice carries a long way. It woke me up out of my sleep. You heard me, said the young woman, sounding both pleased and surprised. My drama teacher used to tell me my voice could wake the living dead. Now I think I believe her. Let me give you a hand, I said. I think there's a protruding rock over there. If you step on it, then I might be able to haul you out of here. But you need to pass me your dog first, otherwise he'll be stuck down there. I haven't got the strength to pull you both out. Don't you think it's better if you call for help? said the young woman. I'm being serious. I don't think I can get out of here myself. My ankle is in agony, and I'm not exactly a gymnast. My dog's also injured his back leg on the fall. I'm not sure if the rock will hold my weight. Look, I'll go back and call for help if it's needed. But I do think if you manage to balance on that little rock, I might be able to pull you out. I think the rock will hold your weight. You're slim, and the rock is pretty stable. The young woman looked anxiously from me to the rock with a vacillating hesitancy. Oh, all right, I suppose I'll give it a bash, she said rather reluctantly. If it doesn't work, I'll get help, I promise, I assured her. I just don't have my cell phone with me, so I'd have to go back to the cottage to get it, and then call for help. And I could be gone for quite some time. No, you can't do that. Don't go. I don't want to be left alone. 
It's so dark in here. The young woman did a sterling job in balancing on the jutting rock, which was the only step in the smooth wall that had cruelly held her captive below. She raised herself rather gingerly to the craggy step, holding her dog in her arms. The poor thing was whimpering as she handed him to me. Her little dog hurt his back leg from the fall, so was very glad to be brought to the surface. He stood by my side, being surprisingly obedient, while I managed with a lot of heaving, grunting, and different squatting manoeuvres that I adopted to help pull the woman out of the ditch without falling down it myself, which was a miracle. Even though she was light, I was not exactly strong. It was after several rather clumsy, bumbling efforts on my part, with the young woman holding my hand, that with one mighty shove, I had successfully pulled her out of the ditch. In the beginning, her body had kept sliding back to the ground below. It had not been easy for her to press her weight on the jutting piece of rock, so that I could gain the leverage that I needed to pull her out. So how I had managed to get her out, I still did not know. I was so grateful I didn't have to go back and get reinforcements. I believe the young lady was relieved about that as well, as when she got out of the ditch, we just laughed together, and I heard the voice in my head saying, I knew you could do it. I looked up and saw the Bigfoot standing through the trees, looking straight at me through his yellow eyes. He nodded his head and then glided away, swinging his arms backwards and forwards as he disappeared. I marvelled how he'd come to this woman's help even though she knew nothing about it. After the woman had stopped laughing, she said, I don't know how to thank you. I thought me and Tubbs would be doomed to stay down there all night, until the morning when somebody might rescue us. It's so typical of me to end up in such a pickle like this. When I was a kid, I got locked in a freezer once, you know, and thank God I was saved before I froze to death. But I've always got myself into scrapes. My dad thinks that I'm accident-prone. Well, I'm glad I could be of help, I said modestly. You help? You've been a lifesaver tonight. I don't know what I would have done without you. I was terrified being there in that dark ditch, not being able to see a thing. It was awful. It was so frightening down there. And the forest was so dark. And at one stage, the crickets and the frogs weren't even singing. It was so ominous. Lesson number one is to never go running into a grove of trees at night. That might be a good idea, I laughed. My ankle is really killing me, she told me, as she bent down to examine it. It did look rather swollen. I think I sprained it when I fell into the ditch. I know Tubbs has hurt his back leg as well. It was a nasty fall for the both of us. I'll have to take him to the vet in the morning to have him checked out. I just hope he hasn't broken anything. I don't think he has. It just looks like a sprain to me, I said. He's such a naughty dog, you know. This is all his fault. I can never be angry with him, though. Tub means the world to me. I know what you mean. He's rather too cute to be angry with. The young woman was cradling the French bulldog in her arms, playing with his ears. You're a naughty boy, Tubbs, she said, kissing his head affectionately. The woman looked up at me apologetically, especially when she realised I was still wearing my pyjamas with sneakers on my feet. I guess she thought she owed me an explanation as to what she was doing in the woods in the middle of the night. So there we are. That is the end of part three of our story. Part four is tomorrow night. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.